ಭದ್ರಂಕರ್ಣೆ ಭೀಷಣು ಯಾಮದೇವಾ ಭದ್ರಂ ಪಶ್ಯೇಮಾಕ್ಷಭಿರ್ಯಜತ್ರ ಸ್ಥಿರೈರಂಗೇಷ್ಟು ಭಾಗಂಸ್ತನೂಭಿ ವ್ಯಸೇಮ ದೇವಹಿತ ಇಯದಾಯು ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಮೇ ವಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ವಿತ್ ಆರ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಸ್ಪಿಷಸ್ ಮೇ ವಿ ಸಿ ವಿತ್ ಆರ್ ಆಯಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಸ್ಪಿಷಸ್ ಮೇ ವಿ ಎಂಜಾಯ್ ವಿತ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಂಗ್ ಲಿಮ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬಾಡೀಸ್ ದ ಲೈಫ್ ಅಲಾಡೆಡ್ ಟು ಅಸ್ ಓಂ ಪೀಸ್ 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 ಬಿ ಆನ್ ಟು ಅಸ್ ಆಲ್ it has a life of its own <laughs> the unchanging support what is it that is the basic support of our life of our existence here relative supports we have definitely and they're obvious we're supported by our parents to begin with and then our general uh, abilities that enable us to get along in this world the whole process of education is to be able to support ourselves so that somehow we can manage even the uh, animals when they are born the job of the mother is to enable the young one to be able to take care of itself to support itself in this world the uh, the mother or the father will teach the youngsters how to hunt how to do whatever is necessary with what with whatever they have learned and been able to use to take care of themselves that they want to teach their offspring but somehow there's always a question in our minds this is valuable whatever supports us in this world there's always a suspicion that there's something something could go wrong something could not work out some some problem could some uh, situation might arise when i would not have that support so the question is what does what should be our support is there any way to avoid this situation or is it absolutely this is the way the situation is this is the way our life is we have certain temporary supports that we've learned to uh, develop and to use as we were growing up and our parents were our support our community was our support our all these things our basic philosophy is our support so many supports we gather from everywhere that is the uh, the big responsibility as we enter life is to find something that will support us throughout our existence but all of these supports that we get there's always some possibility it may not work out or it may work out for a long time and be highly satisfactory but eventually something will happen and that support will give way we lean on it and it's no longer there it's no longer able to support us so what is there anything that is unchanging you know of course religion comes along and says yes 
God is the ultimate support. And different religions have different approaches to that. But the basic message is always, this is your support. God is the support. Everything else will fail, but God will support it. Support you in your time of need. And of course, that is what has been sustaining humanity for untold hundreds of years, thousands of years, and will continue to sustain us because this is the this is what is available around us. We take that and we develop it, we strengthen it, and it does work as a support. It is something we can lean on and it won't fail us. That is, slowly we get that idea. But we're never entirely sure about that. I mean, those who have actually perceived, who have actually seen the reality of this entity that is called God, or the spirit, the divine source, the inner nature, whatever you want to call it, those who have experienced that, they have no doubt that is, this is the support of all supports. This is that which sustains not only our own existence, but sustains everything. Somehow, however, whenever we start off, you know, those who have achieved that level of experience and understanding, that is fine. That is, for them, they have achieved what they needed to achieve. But how do you transmit that message to others? And how do you convince others that you've really achieved what you say you have, that you really have found a stable platform which will not give way under any circumstances? That is what we are always looking for. That is why we, get, we have jobs and careers, and uh, before that we try to have uh, the best possible education, it's all to prepare ourselves for, for that. That is an extremely important, extremely urgent necessity of life. And in a relative way, it has its success, it's, it works very well, except if something goes wrong somewhere in the mechanism. So the question in the back of our mind is always, is there something that can support us no matter what, if everything here in this world gives way? Not just relative things for which relative help is available, but all things, if all things were to give way. Are we, are we really left floating in a in a, an unsupported space and uh, totally at the mercy of whatever it is that will happen. And then uh, correlated to that is the, what has happened to the other people who have already gone. Where are they? What have they achieved? What is that? What is their future? What is there? Is there anything left? I mean, if, if someone has passed away, is that person gone? Or is it part, is that person still undergoing some sort of a transition that slowly will develop? So all these are the important questions that really face us, but we try to avoid them as much as possible. But our, our solution begins when we realize that this is a serious problem and it's got to be solved. If we don't solve it now, we will be at the mercy of the torrents and the ebb and flow of things. 
And that, as human beings, we feel is not worthy of us. There should be something we should be able to reach, some understanding. And of course, for as far as we back as we can look, religions have made uh, great statements about that. Great spiritual figures have come who have asserted, yes, there is a solution. Ask and seek and you shall find. You know, ask and knock and it shall be opened unto you. The words of Jesus, these are the words of the great spiritual teachers. But how to make that real in our lives right now, me, little old me at this point, what have I got? What is it that I, what is it that will sustain me? Where can I understand, can I reach that? Can I actually experience that? That is the question of questions. And uh, the, so many s attempts have been made to answer that. But the final conclusion has always been, whatever anybody else says, whatever you read somewhere, that has to become active in our own lives. Being assured that there is a solution and other people have experienced it and therefore they have tried it and found it to be right, that is not enough. As human beings, we should never accept that. We are endowed with intelligence and uh, deep uh, capacity for search and understanding. We should never accept the fact that other people have done it. It can be done, but it's beyond me. Frequently, people come to that position. Well, yes, but uh, next time I'll go. This time, uh, life is essentially, yeah, OK. But if there is a uh, next time, which so many have asserted, then I'll, at that time, I'll try for spirituality. Now, it is too late. It is, it is this, it is that, this excuse, that excuse. That is totally unacceptable. That is totally uh, unfitting for human beings because we have intelligence we can reach into the deepest uh, mysteries of the universe. We, we can send uh, spacecraft out beyond the beyond, we can land, there are asteroids that are only, you know, just a smidgen of dust, so to speak, in the universe. We've been able to land on an asteroid like that, which you cannot even possibly see. So we can do all these strange things. We can do unbelievable things, but when it comes to doing something for our spiritual, to attain that spiritual depth, somehow there's great hesitation. No, no, I won't do it. But, well, I'm too busy raising these children, you see. And uh, let them, let them learn, let them go ahead. I will be happy just to do this. No matter how young we are or how old we are, at this is the moment, <laughs> right now is the moment when we can make that determination. Yes, I will, I will struggle for that realization. It has been attained by others and I shall also attain it. And what is that? What has been said about that? This unchanging support, this achieving a stable foundation, an unchanging reality that no matter if everything else disappears, if everything else crumbles, that will not crumble. What is that?
And that is always, the answer is always given. That is already within us. That is already, already in our consciousness. That is already something which we have almost within our grasp. And the, uh, one of the most charming expressions of that quest is found in the Kata Upanishad. Kata Upanishad. Of course, Vedanta means the Upanishads. So the foundation of everything is always there. Whenever we have any real fundamental questions, we look into the Upanishads. There it is said in, uh, in a humorous way that whenever a, uh, it was referring to uh, Brahmins in India, whenever a Brahmin loses his cow, he looks for her in the Vedas. But this is, this is a humor, but it is the, this is actually a statement of the reality. Whatever our problem is, the answer is always in the Vedas. That is to say, in the Upanishads, Vedanta means the Upanishads. And one of the most charming of them in that, uh, to de describing that search, which also was one of Swami Vivekananda's uh, favorite statements, is the Kato Upanishad. There, the story of Nachiketas, who goes to the uh, kingdom of death and asks this, these basic questions that he had. And the basic question is our own basic question. It's the center of our life. The basic question he essentially is phrasing is, when someone dies, some people say that existence continues, and others say that, no, he's gone, it's finished, it's all over. Now, what is the truth about the matter? And he's asking the lord of that realm where everyone goes sooner or later, the king of death. And so the whole Upanishad is like that in a very charming and uh, highly inspiring way. It traces that, it answers or approaches that question. And after a, the preliminary story which sets the stage for that, the, uh, what is described is Om. Om is described as the as the supreme, he, he, uh, supreme goal, of the supreme support, Alambaram, that's where the title of the lecture comes from, the unchanging support. So, uh, Nachiketas is asking, you know, that these instructions be given to him. And he asks, that which you behold, that which you know, he's talking to the king of death, that which you know which is being different from dharma and adharma. It's different. Dharma are the rules of conduct, the, uh, the, the, the way to manage the, the uh, scheme of operation in this world, to make a successful journey of this life. That which you hold, behold is different from dharma and adharma, what we ought to do, what we ought not to do. As different from cause and effect. I understand cause and effect. There's a cause and effect is produced. If I see the effect, I search for the cause. All these things are operations that I'm familiar with. But Tell me that which is different, which is fundamental, on which those depend. What is it that's the substratum on which they stand? That which you behold as different from dharma and dharma, different from cause and effect, 
different from what has been and what will be. Tell me that. I have looked all through this world. I have examined all the various laws that have been uh, found in terms of the uh, physical laws, the spiritual laws, psychological laws. I've examined all of that. I've examined the whole of human experience. But what I, I have not found anything. Everything that I've examined has only been an explanation of the limited, of that which comes and goes. And I know all about how things are created and destroyed, how things are born and how they die. I have the, so many theories are there. But that hasn't given me an answer. I've looked at all the philosophies, basically he's saying, I've looked at all the philosophies that have ever been propounded. I've looked at all the attempts that have been made to solve this basic problem. And I have not found anything that does that, that solves the problem. So there must be something else. But you, he's talking to the king of death, Yama, you are the lord of that realm, the past, the present, the future. You tell me that which you see. Tell me what you know, what is the secret. Sometimes the Upanishad is called the secret of death. But that is the question, what is it? We know that things have come into existence and things disappeared. Our whole life is based on that, that situation, what has come. And everything that comes also goes. It lasts for some time and then it disappears. So what is it that's other than that? Then the answer is, the first answer that Yama gives, and that's why we have to pay attention to it. <laughs> it is, he is not uh, leading us gently from what we know into what we don't know, the implications, the, how one thing is derived from another. No, he makes a statement initially as the answer to that question. So when we read it, we have to, it doesn't seem necessarily like the answer to the question. But this is the answer of the one authority who knows how to answer that question, the, that authority that has control over life and death. How human beings, how all beings are born, how they live, how they depart from here, how they come again, the purposes and the, uh, the means of ingress and egress, this is the answer that is given. And you say, oh, well, OK, this is just an allegory. So you know, it need not be taken that seriously. But it is an allegory, yes, but it has been taken seriously for thousands of years. People have used it as the way into the solution of this problem. And uh, so he starts with this first statement. Sarve Veda Yat Padam Amananti. Sarve Veda, those, what all the Vedas, that goal, Padam, that goal which all the Vedas proclaim, Amananti. Then there was what all spiritual books, all spiritual advice, all spiritual systems which deal with this very question, what is, is there anything eternal? Is there a support that will not crumble when it's leaned on? All the spiritual uh, advice on that subject, what, what, what is the one thing, what is the central aspect, the central idea of what is proclaimed? Sarve Veda Yat Padam Amananti, what is that? goal that all these scriptures proclaim. Tapamsi sarvani chayadvadanti, what all the tapas, all the austerity, all the efforts, all the struggles. 
the Pamsi Sarvani Chayad Vadanti, what all these struggles are really trying to tell us. These are the struggles to know, to understand, to see the foundation of everything, the, to see the, the cause of everything, the un, unshakable support of everything. Yadichantu Brahmacharyan Charanti. That ichantu, that desiring which Brahmacharya and Charanti austerities. Hey, Brahmacharya is, is uh, the control of the sexual impulse specifically, but it refers to the control of all uh, natural processes. What this this austerity, the people who want to control, who, who seek to discipline themselves. If a person wants to be a great athlete, tremendous discipline has to be, uh, has to be practiced. Constantly when the, the new season starts, there are these training camps, tremendous uh, austerities they undergo to train themselves to achieve physical greatness or intellectual greatness. You go to a university, and the tougher the university, the better, you know, oh, I'll get such a wonderful degree from this university, I'll be respected everywhere, but I'll have to suffer while, while this is going on. Why do, I want to, why do I want to do this? Okay, I want to get a good job, I want to get a great reputation, now, this is fine, those are the intermediate goals. But these are all on the way, these intermediate, all of our intermediate goals are really on the way to the final goal. We think, oh, I just want a good education to get a great career and all that. Why do I want a great career? Why do I want all these things? I'm still fundamentally trying to answer that basic question. What is it that is real in this continuously changing universe. What is it that does not change? What is the foundation of everything? What is the support that I can lean on that will never crumble? Why? What is it that I have, that I'm aiming for? So these austerities that, that everyone undergoes to do every, anything, anything we want to accomplish is accomplished through austerity, through tapas. It may be of a very simple kind, it may be of a more exalted, a more vigorous, more intensive kind, but everything we want to accomplish in this world is accomplished through some sort of struggle, austerity, deprivation, in order to achieve greatness. That's wonderful. That is how we work. That is our natural, our modus vivendi. This is, a, this is, the, way, this is the way we live. But the question is, is there something that we can struggle for like that that will not disappear? Everything else goes. I mean, even the most magnificent achievements, when the body gets old and tired, all your grand uh, accomplishments become a matter of history. They become pictures on the wall. Oh, this is when I was playing football for such and such a place. Look at me then. Okay, but look at you now. <laughs> you know, so that's fine. <laughs> or, you know, you were, you know, some tremendously great uh, achievement, intellectual achievement, you won the Nobel Prize, but after some time, you can't even remember what you said five minutes ago. <laughs> You know, so, but this is, this is how we are. This is, we all understand that very well. Whatever we, we achieve, whatever grandeur we can achieve physically, intellectually, you know, it's wonderful when it's there, but after some time we know it's going to disappear. The question always is, is there something that does not disappear? And, the Upanishads say there is, all religions say there is, but now, specifically, how is it referred to here in the Upanishads? So he's ask, he's saying, all of these things, 
Tate Padam Sangrahena Bravimi. I am going to tell you that Padam, that goal, Sangrahena, Sangra in, in brief. In a brief context, I will tell you what it is. I will give away that secret. And then what is that secret that he gives? The secret is Om Ityetat. Om is that answer. So you say, okay, well, now, wait a minute. You led me on to expect something absolutely fantastic and absolutely uh, revealing. And you say it is Om. Well, what do you mean by Om? Yeah, people say Om. Well, what is meant by that? So, but he goes on. The rest of the Upanishad, of course, is is to explain that. But then he praises that syllable. We have to find out what it is that he, what is this advice, this unchanging support. aksharam brahma. This akshara, this monosyllable, this uh, expression, om, is what? It is brahman. I mean, brahman means the, uh, the totality of everything. It is the, the spiritual background of everything, which is, it is what we're trying to find. Aksham Brahma, Aksham Param. This Akshara, Etat Akshara, this Akshara is the Supreme. This Om is the Supreme. Aksham Gyatva, knowing Gyatva, knowing this, this uh, syllable. Yo that which you want, we will attain. And uh, Nachiketas was asking for this. What he wanted was that ultimate support. And uh, uh, Yama goes on. Etad alambanam shreshtam. Alambana is the support. So he's asking for that, the support he's asking for. Shreshtam, this is the supreme support. Om is the supreme support. Etad alambanam param. This support is the highest. Etad alambanam gyatva. Knowing this alambana, knowing this support. Brahma loke mahiyate, even in the highest realms, Brahma loka, even in the highest, what to speak of the lower, even in the highest realms, you will be considered as supreme, as an adept, as having discovered that which has to be discovered. So what is this? What is, the, what is the meaning of this saying, this Om? Generally, if you, everything, all the mantras, all the uh, spiritual formulae that are talked about, Om is usually a part of that. So generally things have, there are three kinds of names that a thing can have. There's the physical name, or in this world, what we, how it is called in this world, that reality called it Brahman. Then there is a, a, a name, it's called the Bija Mantra, a, a, a short sound which has been found by seers by ancient rishis, even from ancient times, uh, a bija mantra that is, in a more symbolic way, is symbolic of that Brahman. That Brahman on the, uh, in, the, in the ordinary language, you would say Brahman. In the, the bija mantra, the symbolic form of that, uh, in a more uh, abstract form, is the Bija Mantra. There are, these are usually sim just one single syllables that uh, have been found to be 
lead the mind to a deeper level. <clears throat> but the deepest of all is this Om. On the deepest level, Om is the, is the symbol of that which we're all looking for, that infinite reality. Not, if you express it in our ordinary language, it becomes very crude. You see, it is Brahman. But if you express it in this, in a, as a bija symbol, as a, these are symbols found by mystics in their meditations, they have found these more, it's the, describing the same thing in a more subtle way, deeper and more internal, more meditative way. But the deepest of all is this Om. Om is considered the, uh, an expression of that ultimate reality which we're trying to find, the support of all of our experiences, support of the universe. So in all the mantras, Om is included. And uh, this syllable, Om, I mean, what, how do you get, okay, you could make those statements. But uh, we haven't gotten to any deeper level yet. We're still talking about things on the same level. How do you attain a deeper insight into these things? How do you attain actual experiences of that? So the, the, the great uh, sages who talk about these things, they give us this idea that there are different paths to attaining it, but this particular path of using mantras or meditation is by feeling that reality to be actually present within. In the, so they give in the Upanishads, there are meditations like you imagine in the region of the heart. There is a luminous space. And within that luminous space, you, is, of course, it's an exercise, it's a, uh, it's something to be practiced within the region of the heart. They say there is a luminous space, or you imagine a luminous space, and you fill that luminous space with a sacred object. Whoever or whatever is a sacred object to you. So Christians can uh, think of the, the image of Jesus or it can be a, a mantra, or it can be a symbol of some sort. The point is it's an object of concentration. It's, it's not that it is, you actually think of it as actually being there. It is, an, it is a way of attracting your mind away from the external to that inner reality which is at the basis of everything. And so in the, this process of uh, trying to, in other words, the, the, what all spiritual teachers proclaim is that reality which you're looking for is already there. It is nothing that we have to achieve. It is nothing that we have to create. It's not a building that we have to uh, slowly construct internally, mentally. It is something we have to perceive as being there. And what is it that keeps us from perceiving it? The mind is moving, the mind is restless, the mind is concerned with this, so that for a minute or two or three or a half an hour or an hour, you can concentrate on something wonderful and then the mind goes here and there. But we have not, we've concentrated on it as being an object. If we concentrate on it as being real, as being something really there, as being something within our grasp, the idea is slowly this, we begin to see it as such. We begin to actually experience it as such. One of the great Christian mystics was Brother Lawrence. And he, the practice of the presence of God, the idea was, 
Everything he did for, was for, for Jesus. He says, when I pick up a straw from the ground, it is for his sake. And if he did something which uh, was not successful, he would say, well, you sent such a, uh, an incompetent person as myself to do this. You know, why should you be surprised that it turned out this way? The point is everything is every moment, is every instant of time was centered around the reality of Jesus as being with him all the time, as being within his consciousness. And that is how he lived his days. So the, the, uh, the Upanishads make, this, make these glorious statements that this reality is already there. And uh, the, uh, the Katha Upanishad, uh, after saying, after describing Om, it says, Najayate uh, Mriyateva, it, it is not born and it does not die. This Om, which is the best support. Om being, when you say it in a, uh, say it out like this, Om, Swami Vivekananda made it, uh, you know, had the, expressed it this way that Om, the very, uh, the word itself, ah, u, m, a, u, m, Om, Ah is the uh, a sound in the throat, M mm is a sound when the lips are closed, so U is a sound that goes from the one to the other. So Om is the uh, a symbol for all the sounds that can be made. And all the sounds that can be made refer to all the things that are in existence, because everything that exists has a name associated with it. Swami Vivekananda explains it in this way. So the Om is, the whole idea is somehow to get us to take these spiritual practices seriously. Somehow to concentrate the mind and to not only the mind, but the feelings. The whole being has to feel the presence, the reality of God. That's why uh, Brother Lawrence came up, because this was his whole, uh, this was his whole uh, practice, was to feel that God, in his case, he was, uh, Jesus was there uh, for him. He felt that everything was, that Jesus filled everything. That the reality of God pervades everything. This is the basic, the, we have to feel that. Just simply to say it is only going to leave it at the mental level. We have to go to the level of feelings, to the level where, of the heart, to the level where we feel a more profound, on a more profound level than on the surface. There are other verses in this Upanishad. One other verse is, yad iha taramutra, that which is here is also there. Yadamutra tadanviha, what is there is also here. He goes from death to death. Mrityo samrityo matuti ya iha nāneva pasyati, nāna. If he, anyone who sees multiplicity goes from mrityum to mrityum, from death to death. In other words, you, you're born, you develop, and then everything dies, and then you are again, you again appear. So this will go on and on and on until you perceive that oneness, which is the essence of reality, which is what is really present here. Who see, whoever sees multiplicity, in other words, we should try to see the oneness in everything. We are absolutely adept, we are experts at seeing the differences in things, and that is science. 
To see the difference between one thing and another is extremely important in a scientific sense and extremely important for our surface life. For our surface life, we have to see the difference between one thing and another. Otherwise, this life is impossible. But for spiritual life, for getting spiritual depth, for, for solving the basic problem of life, that's totally the wrong method. We want to see what is the same in everything. What is the one thing that is common to everything, that is present everywhere, that is the background for everything? In other words, you're seeing a movie that has uh, you know, so many different things out there. That movie stops, another movie begins. One life ends, another life starts. Constantly, our life is just basically seeing one movie after another. And this will go on. There's, there's no, it, it is, it's a self, uh, self-perpetrating uh, principle. It will never stop. If you ever accept the idea of incarnation, of reincarnation, there is no way that you can escape being reborn until you finally get the point, until you finally see that which does not change, which is at the heart of everything, which is the support of everything, which is the essence of everything, which is the reality of everything. As long as you take the movie to be real, you'll just have to see one movie after another. When you finally get the point that what is real of the movie is not the movie itself, it's the screen. What is it that doesn't change as you go from life to life? And in this life, as you go from one experience to another, you're born, you're a child, you're growing up, you're a teenager, you're a, a college student, you're a uh, you know, you've got a great career doing fantastic things in society. You get a family, and then you begin to worry about your children's growing up and then getting that same career, going through the same process. Eventually, of course, you'll get too old and you have to retire, and then it becomes a matter of history, and then you start again next time. What is it that we have gained by <laughs> paying attention to that only, we have to pay attention to it. But we, ha we have omitted one thing. We have not seen in all these movies that we're watching life after life, we have not seen the fact that the movie is only an appearance. It comes and goes. When one ends, another one begins. What is it that is steady and constant and never changes? It's the screen, of course. You can portray any thousands of movies but the reality of the movie is nothing but a flickering of light. The reality that you're watching, that what is real about the movie is the screen. And what is real about our life is God. God being present every moment, everywhere, all the time. And on that reality of God, we're projecting this whole universe. Sometimes it's seen as a person that appears before children appears in a disguise. Swami Brahmananda, once there was some children were playing, so he put on a tiger's mask and he came up there, Grrr, and the children were all frightened. Except one little boy who said, oh, no, no, I know, it's just Maharaj, it's not a real tiger. So eventually, this life has to be looked at like that. What we are really seeing, what, we, what is present every moment in our life, is God, the Spirit, the infinite, the eternal, whatever name you give to it. So until, until we begin to realize, yeah, the movie is important and enables us to live in this life. We have to pay attention to it. That is very true. We have to learn about it. We have to develop this. Okay, okay. But that is not the essence of what's going on. 
What's going on is that God alone is here. God alone exists. The reality of the movie is the screen, the unchanging background. That unchanging background is described as Satchit Ananda, existence, consciousness, joy, bliss. So in all of our experiences, that same background is there. Whatever we experience has to be seen, first of all, as God, and then we can look at the experience. That should be the way we deal with it. Yes, we have to pay attention to the experience. Obviously, it is important. It not only important, it is crucial. Without it, we couldn't manage our life at all. But if we forget the initial part of it, that's where we get into trouble. We forget the fact that we're actually experiencing is God. There is only God inside and outside. Everything that is changeable, this is the statement of the Upanishads, everything that is changeable is seen on a background which is unchangeable. And it, we have to experience that background. We have to look for that background. We have to not only look at it in the sense, oh yeah, some time or other I will realize it, well, maybe not this life, next life. That's, but next life, next life, it can, you can just go on like this indefinitely. Once you accept the, the idea of reincarnation, that has a wonderful effect. The effect is that until you realize God, you will not be released. You will have to again and again experience that. But when that reality is seen as all those great souls who, who have experienced that reality have told us, they have again and again said, God alone exists. Sarvam kalidam brahma. Sarvam kalu idam brahma. All this sarvam, Kalu indeed, Brahman is Brahman. Brahman is that the name, the word we use for that unchanging reality, that background, that screen upon which all of our experience is based. And this is the this is the basic statement that is made. And Om is seen as the best example or the best symbol of that reality. Because Om, by its, you could say by the uh, vibrations of the word or whatever, however you want to phrase it, it is thought to be closest to, as close as words can reach to describing that reality. Of course, usually to that Om is added other things. For instance, uh, Jesus, the name of Jesus, or Krishna, or Rama, Rama Krishna, all these names are added, different things are added to that. But the basic form of every mantra has that Om on it. Om as being thought of being the, the closest that speech can come to that. Swami Vivekananda interpreted it that way, as the closest that speech can come to that, to that reality. And the, uh, the, but the thing is that what it is symbolic of is that thing which is the background of everything. Now, how does one make that? Just think of it this way as the background of everything. It's wonderful. But the heart is not in it. In other words, if that is something we can think about. Yes, I can understand that significance. I can think about it, and it becomes very nice. It's, I, I think about so many things. I think about, uh, you know, if I hear that a uh, saddle, I mean, a uh, satellite is going to go around Venus or the moon or uh, you know, someone is going to land on an asteroid. Yes, wonderful. I, in that same way, I think of, yes, Om is uh, symbolic of Brahman. Okay, fine, uh, but then there's no difference. What is it that's going to make a difference? 
So we add to that Om, that idea of the all-pervasiveness of Om, we add the idea of a sacred name, like Jesus or Buddha or Ramakrishna or you know some name, whatever our special ishtam, our special chosen ideal is. And then we feel the presence of that. Because what is the meaning of Jesus or Ramakrishna or Buddha? What is their real significance? I mean, we have altars which we have, you know, in which the, these uh, entities are worshipped. But until that altar is in our own hearts, it's not going to make that much difference. As long as you're worshiping being something that is outside, that's very good. I mean, there's nothing wrong or uh, nothing to be criticized in that, but it has to be carried farther. I should feel the presence of that chosen ideal, whatever I have chosen. I should feel the presence of that everywhere. I should feel the constantly that that reality is present. And by feeling that presence, specifically of that particular form that I am considering, you know, that I, I have chosen, by feeling the presence of that, I actually feel the presence of Brahman. Sarvam Khalidam Brahma, everything is Brahman. I simply, those words I say and then <laughs> It doesn't make any further difference. But how do I actually feel that that is true? One of the important gateways is these holy people, these, these holy, these incarnations, these great souls. They have realized Brahman, Brahma vid, Brahma eva bhavati. The knower of Brahman becomes Brahman, totally identified with Brahman. When we feel the presence of that, we are feeling the presence of Brahman, the presence of God, the presence of the infinite and the eternal. So that is, the, that is one of the uh, most effective ways of uh, getting into that realm, getting the idea that there is a reality here which is unchanging, which is fundamental, which is expresses itself in everything that we experience. There is such a thing. And by feeling the presence of that within ourselves, but we, by limiting it first to, say, this image of Jesus uh, that I'm meditating on or whatever uh, symbol we have chosen, by feeling that that reality is present within me, that reality is identified with Brahman when I feel its presence within, there comes that feeling within me also, that that is, that Brahman is within me, that reality is within me, I also feel that. That is the way, one of the ways of approaching that reality, or making it seem real that not only it is real, it is existence, it is the support. So that is the, uh, the title was the support, the unchanging support. Anyway, the unchanging support of our life is already there. That is the fortunate aspect. There's nothing we have to manufacture. It's something that is already there, but we have to realize its existence, and that also is approachable, that also can be done. So in this way, some path we can find through multiplicity toward that essence, that unity, which the Upanishads constantly proclaim as the reality that supports everything. Thank you. Mano Buddha Hunk
Oh 